this weekend, Rachel and I finally made it out to see the Mr. Rogers movie with some friends. I've been looking forward to this movie for about since I heard it was coming out, but especially since we finally found a date a few weeks ago. And so I started reading one of my all-time favorite tiny books I keep, keep in my office called The World According to Mr. Rogers. We should all read this book. It's just a collection of quotes from Mr. Rogers. And in anticipation of the movie, some of our kids started watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And they're streaming old episodes on the PBS Kids app, and we're watching him. And it's amazing how 40 years later, everything about the show is exactly the way it's always been. You'll see what I mean as you watch the introductory clip this morning. Thirty plus years, the introduction, you all want to clap, I know, he's so nice. You just smile when you watch him up there. The introduction never changed in over 30 years. He does the exact same song, which by the way, he is not welcoming you to the neighborhood. He welcomes you to this neighborhood if you pay close enough attention. The movie got the title wrong, just an observation. So, but it's one of those things we all miss because you think you know it, but he says this, not the. But it never changes. The words are the same. The motions are the same. His clothing hardly changes, does it? He always wears a cardigan knit by his mother every single episode. What a faithful mom he had. Christmas can feel a little bit like the Mr. Rogers show, can't it? Everything is the same year after year after year. We go to our homes and we put up the same, if you are in my house, a fake tree, the same fake tree and the same Christmas ornaments, and they go in roughly the same spot every time, and we watch the same Christmas movies, and we go to the exact same Christmas parties with the same people who were there last year, and even in church, we sing the same songs year after year during Advent. We listen to the same scriptures, roughly. We light the same candles. It can feel routine, and it also, like Mr. Rogers, it's oddly comforting to know exactly what's going to happen week after week, isn't it? To know it will be the same and you can count on it. It's a reminder that our God doesn't change, that our God is always there for us, that he can be trusted, that he doesn't abandon us. And yet, it's interesting that this was exactly the anxiety the Jewish people had when Jesus was born. Had God abandoned them? Could their God be trusted yet? Because they had been in exile in Babylon, and they had returned, but things weren't quite how they, weren't quite how they expected. The temple had been restored, had been destroyed, and now it has been rebuilt, but not quite how they thought. And God had left the temple, but he had never come back. God always lived in the temple. He always lived in the tabernacle. We have stories of him coming down to move in, into both places, but when the temple is rebuilt... There's no story of God coming back to live with his people. And so the Jews wondered, will God come back? What, will, what do we have to do so God will finally come and live with us again? As we consider this question, we return our attention today to a passage in Scripture familiar to most of us, Matthew 1, 18 through 25. But I urge you today, as we hear this story, you already know, to try to listen with fresh ears again, to hear it as if it's for the first time. This is our word of our, the Lord for us today from Matthew. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. 
But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Who are we, Lord God, that you should come to us? Yet you have visited your people and redeemed us in your Son. As we prepare to celebrate his birth, make our hearts leap for joy at the sound of your word and move us by your Spirit to bless your wonderful works. We ask this through him whose coming is certain, whose day draws near, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The story is one we know well, sadly. A young woman is found to be pregnant. It's a bit of a scandal. In those days, maybe more than a scandal. It would have been more than just the talk of the school or on social media. Because Mary and Joseph were engaged. And engagement back then wasn't like engagement today. Think more like married. Because when you were engaged at that, in that day, to end the engagement required you to get legally divorced. You did not back out of engagements. You didn't give a ring back. You had to go to the courts, and it was a huge scandal in the whole town. So it's like you're married, except for one key thing. When you're engaged, when you're betrothed, you don't live together. You certainly don't do things that make people pregnant together. In fact, you're not allowed to be alone together. And so Mary is pregnant, and Joseph knows it's not his, and so sin has happened, and according to Jewish law of the day, Joseph is not only allowed to divorce Mary, he is legally obligated to divorce Mary. To not divorce her is to join in her sin, to become ritually impure himself. And so Joseph has a choice. And his choice is not, do I divorce her or not? It's, do I divorce her publicly and shame her and also run the risk of her being stoned and killed? Or do I do so quietly to try to avoid her shame, to try to protect her in the midst of her sin? He's trying to do the wonderful, good, gracious thing, yet also following the law because he has to divorce Mary. He cannot marry her now. And honestly, no matter what Joseph does, in that day, no one else would ever marry either. Would ever marry, marry either. Try to say that really fast a couple times and you'll get it wrong too. Um, no one else will marry here either because someone who got pregnant outside of marriage is unmarriable from then on. So her life is going to be, have a baby, live with mom and dad. When mom and dad die, if your baby can take care of you because now it's a grown man, you'll have support. Otherwise, you'll be homeless and you'll be begging for food on the side of the road. And this is what Mary agreed to when the angel said, God wants to bring a baby into the world through you. And she said, okay, whatever God's will is, I'll do it. That was what she agreed to and she knew it in the moment. That was the risk she took. When we come to Christmas, we think of parties and celebrations. When we think of babies, we think of baby showers and bridal parties for people getting married. But that is not the story of joy and gladness of Christmas. Christmas for Mary and Joseph was a time of fear, a time of anxiety. For Mary, I imagine a lot of loneliness. There was certainly gossip and slander and also a desperate clinging to God. Some of us may be feeling like we're standing right there today, too. We see the Christmas cards in the Hallmark movies where everyone, everything turns out all right and the families all get together and get along well and it's always happy. And 
we feel instead a bit of dread for the week ahead. There may be sorrow for the week to come, knowing that someone won't be there who you wish would be there. There may be anxiety, wondering how do we get through another week with that family member who hurt us in the past. Will so-and-so even show up? And if they show up, what will they do? And how hard do we have to bite our tongue when the passive-aggressive comments start coming? Do we have to bite it till we taste the blood? How long? How long will this last, we may wonder. For others, we don't have anxiety over family parties, but we see all all the, the trees and the presents other people have, and that's just not our life this year. There's not much of a tree, and there aren't many presents. We're just more worried about putting food on the table and making sure we can keep a roof over our heads. The latest and greatest toys for our kids aren't even on the radar screen of possibilities today. For others of us, the memories of Christmas are filled with a lot of sadness as well as celebration. It was 38 years ago, December 28th, that my grandpa passed away from a stroke. He had the stroke the day after Thanksgiving and died three days after Christmas. His grandson, my cousin Dan, died 17 years ago, December 23, tomorrow, after a three and a half month battle with leukemia. His dad's going through his first Christmas without his wife today or this week, because she passed away earlier this summer. For some of us, that's where we are today. I think of the Wallace family. You leave a funeral on Saturday and you celebrate, or on Friday, and you celebrate Christmas on Wednesday. And in the middle of all of our grief, we still try to celebrate, don't we? For Mary, this first Christmas is one of anxiety. Her life is falling apart. We maybe we can identify a little with that sometimes too. And then God sends an angel to Joseph in a dream. And Joseph is finally given the context of what's actually going on so he knows that he can stay with Mary and he can take on himself. Think about what it meant for Joseph to stay with Mary for just a moment. It means that everyone in town now thinks that Jesus is Joseph's son. No one thought Jesus was born from someone else. Joseph stayed with Mary. Jesus must have been Joseph's kid. So Joseph was the one who sinned and engaged in activity before he was allowed to legally. Joseph takes the gossip and the slander on himself when he chooses to stay with Mary. It goes off of her and comes on to him. And then in the dream, the angel gives Joseph a name. He says, name your son Jesus. And then later, Matthew tells us that the prophet said his name would be Emmanuel. The name of name Jesus was a really common name in that day. It simply means that God saves, which was the longing of all of the Jewish people. And so lots of little boys were giving the name Jesus because they wanted God to save them because they thought and believed that they were still in exile. They had come back from Babylon, but in all of the important ways, they were still living in exile. They were still bearing the consequences of their sin. When the exile ended, they should have come home to the promised land and ruled the nations, but they came home and the nations ruled them. They should have come home and rebuilt the temple and God should have come down to live in it, but instead the temple that they experienced was rebuilt by Herod the Great, who is not even Jewish. He's an Idumean who is immoral and kills all sorts of people, and the Jewish people hate him, and now they have to go worship in a temple he built with the money he stole from them. And they're in exile. This is not the way the world is supposed to be. They need to be saved from their sins. They need to be saved from the consequences of their sin. Sometimes we need to add that word, don't we? Because we think that when you get saved from sin, you stop sinning. But who here has stopped yet? Nobody? Me either, right? We still do. So when we say saved from sins, we don't mean we're saved from sinning. We still sin. All of us still struggle with that. We are saved from bearing the consequences that our sin deserves in our lives. It's not hard for most of us to come up with some of the sins that we commit. We won't make you say them publicly today. But here, you know, there's some safe Christian examples we can list in church. We might struggle with lust or greed in our lives. We might struggle with anger or jealousy. We might struggle with lying and gossip, especially when we share it as prayer requests. Because that's the safe way to gossip in church. It makes you sound spiritual and you still get to sin. It's great. Some of you are feeling a little, little nudge here. Sorry. It's just an observation. 
We might struggle with laziness or with workaholism. It's amazing. No matter what you do, you can feel guilty about it. I'm at work. I should not be at work. I'm not at work. I probably should be. You can feel bad either way. But the, for the Jewish people, it was not the individual sins that they were most worried about. It was the corporate sins. We can think of, um, for the, the corporate sins they would think about, would be the sins of oppression of the poor. This is what Amos and Isaiah both talk about extensively in, in their prophetic works. That the reason God is angry with the people of Israel is not their individual sin, it's that as a society, they're oppressing poor people. They're not taking care of the weakest and the poor among them. Or they would point to the fact that as a society, they are, they're idolaters and they're worshiping false gods. That's what the other prophets all talk about too. And it was these national sins, their communal sins, they believed, that led to the exile. Otherwise, it would have been an individual punishment. But it was national. The whole nation had engaged in the sin. And so the whole nation is still in exile. And how do they as a nation come back into the presence of God? What do they need to do, they wonder? And so when we say that Jesus came to save them from their sins, they would not have heard, Jesus is saving me from my sin of greed, although they might have heard that too. They would have primarily heard, Jesus is saving us from the exile that we experience because we as a people have not been faithful to our God. We have not been faithful to God. So he would end the exile. He would come and deliver them from their oppressors. God would come back and live in the temple. A holy priest would purify the temple and all would be made well. That was the hope. That's how they know the sin has been removed, that their consequences are taken away. But what they didn't think about is that the greatest consequence of sin is not a political exile. It's how sin alienates us. Sin alienates us from God, but also from one another. We can see how our individual sin alienates us in our personal relationships. When you betray a trust in a friendship, that friendship is hurt. It doesn't work the same way that it used to anymore. But we also become isolated through our corporate sins. I read a story just a week or so ago of a man who lives across the street from an elementary school that is almost entirely um, children of color, so my, minority children, not, not Caucasian kids. He lives across the street. He's a white man, and he has chosen to put across the front of his house Confederate flags and swastikas. Because, well, he's racist, right? Individually. But he's in a culture in which he thinks that's a normal, okay thing to do. Because otherwise, he wouldn't dare do it. But it's acceptable for him to do that. It's accepted in the culture for him to do that. And in the process, can you imagine any child in that school ever thinking that's someone I want to have a relationship with? Could he ever have a relationship with that school? His racism separates him from those other people. He can't even see them as people. He puts Confederate flags and swastikas on his front lawn. How would that feel if you're the son of a former slave? How would it feel if you're Jewish? How would it feel if you're anyone who's not a German or Dutch white person with blonde hair? And he's alienated. Often our corporate sin is not so bold and out there. It's a little more subtle. In a consumer-driven economy, think about what it means for us that we are often defined and define one another in our culture as consumers. It's a consumer-driven economy, isn't it? If that's the case, if that's where we primarily see one another as consumers, then our worth and value is tied to our ability to consume things. And if that's the case, then paid work matters more than unpaid work, right? Because paid work lets you consume things. Unpaid work doesn't. Do you ever see that in our culture that we value paid work over unpaid work? Ask any stay-at-home parent which one gets valued more, right? We see that, don't we? Or unemployed people don't matter as much as employed people. Because employed people are earning money and they can consume things. Unemployed people can't do that. Adults matter more than kids because adults earn money to consume things and kids just suck it away from mom and dad. Younger adults who are working matter more than retirees because retirees don't have as much money to consume things anymore. The rich matter more than the poor because the poor can't consume but the rich can and we're a consumer-driven economy. The rich matter more in our world, don't they? 
As a society, we have dehumanized one another into targeted marketing segments rather than as image bearers of God. And we isolate ourselves from one another because we no longer see each other as people, but as consumers. That's one of the ways our culture has dehumanized us and alienated us from one another. Or we can look at the tribalism that plagues so much of our world and culture today. This innate desire we all have to be with and spend time with people who like us and think like us and act like us and look like us. The downside of that is it often comes with an accompanying fear and vilification of those who are not part of the tribe. It's this tribalism in our politics that keeps the parties from compromising and getting anything done in Washington because you can't compromise with someone that you define as the enemy. You don't compromise in war, you win. We can't compromise if we define each other as the enemy. It's that same tribalism if we look back in history in the 20s and 30s in the U.S. and in Europe and in the, in the teens already in the Soviet Union that led to World War II and the atrocities of World War II and led to the Cold War and the atrocities that the Soviet Union can, committed as well as the dictators we were willing to support in our fight against the Cold War because we had turned the other into someone who wasn't human. And you'll do anything to, to, to defeat the enemy, even compromise your values. And we dehumanize one another. While we often miss how these corporate sins alienate us from others, I would suggest today that even more, these corporate sins alienate us from God. Because if you can't see the image of God in others, if you've dehumanized them, if you've vilified them, if you've made them into another, if you can't see the image of God in them anymore, then you can't see God. Because God reveals himself in his image bearers, and if you can't see some of them, you're missing part of, part, out on part of who God is. And you're missing out on how God's revealing himself to you in his world through his image bearers because you can't even see them as people anymore. And you've alienated yourself from them and from our God. And there are consequences for our sin. We alienate ourselves from the very presence of God because of the individual and corporate sins that we engage in. And so if Jesus has come to save us from the consequences of our sin, if that's what he's come to do, how do we get delivered from it? I think we get the answer in the second name Jesus has given. Emmanuel, God with us. The Jewish people thought their deliverance would come in a conquering hero and someone who would lead them into battle and kill all their enemies. But as often happens, God's ways surprise those who think they know him best. Because God ends the exile that they experience not through war, not through purifying the temple of all of the sinners, not in a dramatic display of his glory in the temple, but in a little village in a small house that is so crowded there's no room in the guest room and so they put the baby in a manger right where everyone will walk by and see the guest of honor, Jesus. Martin Luther, the great church reformer of the 1500s, put it this way in one of his many reflections on why God came as a baby. He says this, If Christ had arrived with trumpets and lain in a cradle of gold, his birth would have been a splendid affair. But it would not be a comfort to me, he says. He was rather to lie in the lap of a poor maiden and be thought of little significance in the eyes of the world. Now I can come to him. Now he reveals himself to the miserable in order not to give any impression that he arrives with great power, splendor, wisdom, and aristocratic manners. God doesn't come revealing his power and his glory because it would be terrifying. Think for a moment what it would be like if God actually came and revealed himself to us as he is. When he sends a messenger, what's the first thing every messenger from God, every angel says? Don't be afraid. Because when a messenger from God comes, they're so glorious, it's terrifying. When Moses sees the backside of the glory of God, so imagine you leave a room, the remainder of you that's still in the room when God does that, is so glorious that Moses' face glows for a month and the people make him cover his face because they're scared of him. Could you imagine, would anyone dare approach God if he came in all of his glory? No one would approach God if he came in his glory. It would be horrifyingly beautiful and you would run in fear. Fear. 
Because you couldn't stand in that kind of glory. So God comes as a baby. Is anyone here scared of babies? Some of you are scared of babies, apparently. <laughs> Most of us are not scared of babies, except for a few of you. Don't tip them upside down and hold them carefully, and you're usually okay. Um, but people love babies. When you have a baby, what do people do with babies? They hold them close. They smell them. Because there's something about the baby, not the newborn clean baby smell after they had a bath. Baby smell, that's wonderful, right? We love newborn baby smells. Right? So we love babies. We're not scared of them. We want to protect them. So when God chose to come into the world, he could have come in all of his glory, but he came as a baby because he wanted you to not be scared. And he wanted you to want to come and meet him and see him. So one of the questions we have to ask ourselves this Christmas season is simply this. Do you know that baby? Not do you go to church, not do you know stories about the baby, but do you actually know Jesus yourself? Do you have a relationship with Jesus on your own? Is it more than just an idea in your head? Is it more than just a tradition you follow? Is it a person you know? If it's not a person you know and you want to talk about it, I would love to talk after church with you. If you are scared to talk to me after church because people might see you talk to me and now they think, oh, they must not know Jesus, I have a solution for you. On the back of your connection card, very subtly right now, don't let anyone see, so no one has to know. There's a box you can check that says, I want to talk to Pastor Greg about Jesus. You check it, and I'm going on vacation starting Christmas. But after that, I will contact you to find a time for us to meet. And I'd be happy to take you out for coffee or tea or whatever it is you like to drink, or we could eat caramels, whatever you want, and we can talk about Jesus some. I'd encourage you to do that if you want to know more about who Jesus could be in your life. But of course, part of the gospel is not simply that God wants us to have, be reconciled to him. God wants us to be reconciled to him. Not me individually, but us collectively. And for us to collectively be reconciled to God, we have to be reconciled with one another. In scripture, God does not often call individual people. He calls families. He calls communities. He wants a society to be reconciled to him and to one another. Which makes sense because if Jesus came to, to save us from the consequences of our sin and sin leads to alienation from God and to, from others, then part of that reconciliation has to be a restoration of the relationships we break. Otherwise, he's not saving us from the consequences of our sin. He's not restoring what our sin broke. So how does Jesus do that? How do we get reconciled to one another? Let me offer two quick ways today. First is this. When you gather around the manger... And you look at people across the baby. You look at them through the baby, through Jesus. And you give your allegiance to Jesus. You find a new bond with people who've given their allegiance to Jesus too. Suddenly you become part of a community that has different political leanings than you do. And you become part of a community that has people of different ethnic backgrounds than you and people who come from different nations than you do, and people who speak different languages than you, and people of different incomes than you, and people of different marital statuses and different ages and different life experiences than you, and yet you have a common bond because you've all said, I give my allegiance to Jesus. And I choose the word allegiance carefully because faith is about putting your trust in Jesus. And if he's your king and you trust your king, you're loyal to your king. And so you have to be, you give your allegiance to Jesus when you put your faith in him. And so if you have a common allegiance to Jesus, then you have a bond with one another to go seek the things that Jesus seeks. And suddenly the ways our world tries to divide us don't matter so much. Because our bond to Jesus matters more. And so part of how Jesus reconciles us is he says, if you love me, you've got to love the people I love. When you get married, you love your spouse's family, even when they drive you batty sometimes. That's just part of what it means to love someone else, doesn't it? You love the people they love. If you love Jesus, you will love the people Jesus loves. And by the way, God sent Jesus into the world to save who? The whole world. There is no one outside the love of God that we have an excuse not to love. So if you give your allegiance to Jesus and you don't love someone, you have some difficult work to do because either you have not given your allegiance to Jesus and you need to work on what that means for you then, or you've got a lot of hard work to do of how do you learn to love that person. Doesn't mean you have to like them, but how do you learn to love that person like Jesus does? Second thing Jesus does is he shows us how to love people. 
So if we give our allegiance to Jesus, we want to do the things Jesus does and live the way Jesus does. And so Jesus demonstrates in his life, how do we love our neighbors? How do we love people who persecute us? How do we handle the conflicts in our lives with other believers and even non-believers? How do we live into our marriages in ways like Jesus might live into that kind of a relationship? How do we care for people in need if we're trying to be loyal to Jesus? Between now and Easter, we're going to spend every Sunday in the book of Matthew. We'll be following along with what Christians call the lectionary cycle. It's a three-year cycle of readings through, through, through the Bible. We'll be looking, almost, almost exactly following that cycle, looking through the book of Matthew as we follow Jesus. And he'll talk about all of those things. How do we get reconciled to people who have hurt us? How do we handle people who are persecuting us? What do we do? If we've given our allegiance to Jesus, we respond to those situations the way Jesus does. And Jesus' way always leads to reconciliation and to loving those people. How we get reconciled in life is we begin to live more like Jesus did. We begin to see people through the eyes of Jesus. Mr. Mr. Rogers used to invite us into his perfect neighborhood. It's a neighborhood where everyone knew how to talk about their feelings. People could resolve their conflicts with words. It's exactly the way we would want our children and us to live better in this world. It was a picture-perfect neighborhood, so perfect that even racial strife in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was overcome. One of my favorite Mr. Rogers episodes is from, I think, the second season. He has Officer Clemens come over. Officer Clemens is African-American. And they sit in a pool. Mr. Rogers has his feet in the pool, and he invites Mr. Rod- uh, Officer Clemens to cool his feet off in his pool, too. And as a kid, it means nothing when you watch that. But those of us who know history well know that at the time... African Americans were not allowed to swim in public pools with white people because of the racism in our country. But in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, the police officer is African American and he swims in a pool with Mr. Rogers and it's no big deal because that's the way it is in the kingdom of God. Mr. Rogers invites us to join him in this perfect neighborhood he lives in. Who wouldn't want to live in that neighborhood where racial strife and divisions have been overcome and we can talk about feelings and resolve our conflicts well? I want to live in that neighborhood. But it's interesting. In Scripture, God doesn't invite us to live in his neighborhood. God comes and moves into ours. God moves into the mess of our lives and the chaos and the hurt and the loneliness and the loss, all of the things that sin has wrought in our lives. And he says, let me show you how to live in the middle of this. Let me show you how to live so that this world becomes a little bit more like God's neighborhood in heaven. Let me show you how to live a fully human life as I intended for you to live. Let me show you how to live into my kingdom already today in anticipation of the day when it comes fully, when Christ comes back again. God doesn't ask us to move into his neighborhood. He came to move into yours. Believe this gospel and live in its peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that often we want to run away from our neighbors and run away from each other, and our sin often alienates from others, us from others. And yet we know that you are God who has come to bring reconciliation, reconciliation to you and other people. And so we ask today that we might begin to live more faithfully in the ways of Jesus, that we might love as he did, that we might respond to conflicts and struggles and to persecution and to pain in our lives the way he did, that in us people might get a glimpse of your kingdom come. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.